All the way to uh, 6 o'clock. I ain't going to lie to you. We're leaving at 6 tonight. <laughs> uh, and I've been given the opportunity, if I want, to drop the mic at any point between now and 6.30. But uh, my gut is that uh, we will do the four hours and be on the air till 6 o'clock. Uh, so that's where we're going to be. 877-337-6666 is the number to join, of course. Got a great show for you today. As the New York Mets lose again yesterday, Starling Marte allergic to the big hit. Uh, but who am I kidding? It'd be hard to uh, you know get into it really in depth, considering that this uh, will put a, a wrap on at least for now. You never know what the future holds, obviously. But uh, we started this show on uh, November of 2020, and here we are, damn near three years later. And uh, I am uh, the most uh, privileged and blessed person I think on the planet Earth to have been given the second opportunity uh, at a job here on what is without regard, the uh, without dispute rather, the greatest sports talk radio station in all of America and uh, by some uh, metrics, the greatest radio station in America to come back and continue living out what has been a dream of mine for a very long time, which was to do uh, radio in New York City and on WFAN. And I'm privileged to be given the opportunity uh, to also do this show. You know, a lot of times when you're at the uh, the end of, of a career at a radio station, you kind of do a show, and after that show's over, they're like, all right, that's it, that's your last show, and you don't get the opportunity uh, to do this. Uh, so I, I'm grateful for that because I've seen a lot of people, some will leave on bad terms and some will leave on great terms, who aren't given the opportunity to do a final show and uh, say goodbye to the audience that you know has given me everything in life. Uh, and that's a reality. You know, I had a long career prior to coming to WFAN, but obviously financially and just career accolade-wise and, and opportunity and legacy, WFAN is the most important stop in my career, which started on August 24th, 1991 at a 5,000-watt AM radio station in Buffalo, New York called WGR. And now I made it, you know, to the behemoth in the very top of the mountain. And I'm grateful for, uh, for the opportunity that the fan has given me. And grateful, uh, Evan, uh, for saying yes, because three years ago, uh, you had a successful show. You didn't have to uh, take the risk, and it was a risk. There was no guarantee that we would be successful. And now here we are uh, three years later, and you're on to uh, another opportunity with Tiki Barber. I'm dying to find out what the name of that show is going to be. Hopefully you're going to reveal that to us here today, because <laughs> uh, me and the guys were trying to figure out does it go Tiki and Evan? Is it Evan and Tiki? Does Afternoon Evan kind of flex a little bit? Does that matter does that Tiki much? Does Tiki flex? Does, I, that, I, does it matter? At the end of the day, it will have nothing to do with the overall success of the show. Yeah. But I'm dying to hear which way it goes. Do you want me to tell you? I'd like to build to it okay, if I can. No, <laughs> tell you whatever the hell you want. But And I don't get all mushy about it. I, I don't think I'm going to cry be all that emotional today. Because as many people think, I have a dead black heart. Uh, that being said, thank you, because uh, you had to be willing to obviously also sit next to me, and that was a decision you had to made by yourself and with your family, and ultimately you know, get involved in a type of show that you hadn't really done before on WFAN, and really jump to the deep end and be willing to do it. So I, I do uh, thank you for that. I'm grateful to you for being willing to be open-minded to a different type of show uh, that you didn't have to say yes to. So thank you for that. Well, no problem. I had a fun time, man. I mean, I thought for a second this would be a disaster. I thought this would be awful. I thought I'd go home crying every single night. And the truth is, I went home every night <laughs> happy. There you and go. I said, boy, that was wild. It was like doing a roller coaster ride every day yeah. from 2 to 6.30, 2 to 7, 2 to 6. And I very much enjoyed it. What's weird is when I did my last show with Joe, two days later, I started with you. So it was immediate. Oh, was it that? I didn't even know It that. was immediate. It was. I finished this long run with Beningo, 14 years, whatever it was, almost full 14 years. And then two days later, I'm doing the show with you. What's weird is that it hasn't sank in yet that I'm not doing a show with you on sure. Monday. Right. And I think it's one of those things where I will get emotional. Because I really did. I had a great time doing the show with you. Uh, that's not me just giving you something nice to say. I genuinely did. And I'm going to miss you. But right now... It don't feel real. Well, let me just say I'm this. I'm going to call you in a week and a half. Please crying. do. Please do. I'll take it. I'll That's take what it. It's gonna so end. I think today's also a show where I can kind of reveal behind the curtain a little bit to what yeah. goes on at FAN. So as I'm, I'm going to go videotape it, and I'll, I'll put it out later. 
As much as Evan just said he's going to miss me, yeah. he's already moving stuff into my office. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not BSing you. Like, I've taken stuff down. I'm moving. I'm packing up some boxes. Evan's got a Brooklyn Net frame <laughs> thing on the wall. I put that in immediately. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, listen, we'll obviously talk some sports today. Uh, got to be fair to the radio station, to the listeners who don't give a rat's ass if I'm here on Monday or not. And I respect that there are those who out there that don't want to hear a four hour goodbye either uh, i will tell you this i have not asked a single person to call in uh if people call in obviously we'll take those calls and uh i'll be you know grateful for that uh so if you do want to call talk about whatever you want to talk about sports wise we'll do it if you want to say goodbye obviously i'll take those calls and i and i would say this i did an interview earlier today with neil best of newsday uh, I'm not sure when that interview is coming out. I imagine today, tomorrow, whenever it's going to be. Don't worry. I'll give you my login so you can yeah, read it. Yeah, and that's the other thing. None of you are ever going to read it. <laughs> uh, and I like Neil. He's a good dude. Um, but, you know, one of the, the things that came up that I was trying to explain to Neil is the relationship between a talk show host and an audience. It's much different than TV. Uh, and I remember, I'll never forget, you know, when Boomer and I started back in 2007, I was trying to, and no disrespect to Boomer, I was trying to explain to Boomer what that's like, that even being the quarterback of the New York Jets, right, going to the Super Bowl with the Cincinnati Bengals and all that, I said, you're about to embark upon something that is different. You know, when people watch you play football, you know, their fans, they watch you play football, you got a helmet on, and they love you because you represent their football team, the public trust that is a franchise. When you do sports talk or any talk radio, and if you do really well, you build a very personal connection with an audience member, 99% of which you will never meet in your lifetime, even if you wanted to. And I said, be ready for that. And that's something you've never experienced before. People are going to know your life. They're going to know your kids' names. They're going to know more about cystic fibrosis. They're going to know about you know who your daughter might be dating, that kind of stuff. And it, it's very intrusive. Uh, but it's also what separates really great talk shows from you know anything else that's out there in the media, blogs, you know, podcasts, TV shows, etc. And when I did come back with you three years ago, I you know uh, Chris Oliveira, the architect, and I had a lot of really deep conversations about my return. Not from a standpoint of could I do radio still? I always knew I could do radio. I thought that I could still just show up and do a really good, entertaining radio show. The question mark we both had. And he impressed upon me was there's no guarantee the audience will accept you back because you hurt them. Because they love the show so much, Boomer and Carton, much like the audience that loved Joe and Evan, obviously loved Joe and Evan and Mike and Chris and whoever else. And that personal connection, he said, the only thing that's unaccounted for is whether or not the audience accepts you back. And there's no way to predict that. We figured sales would accept me back. I had a great relationship with clients and you know companies and all that stuff. But we just weren't sure would the audience accept me back. And I'll never forget, we had been on the air for literally two days, right? We did two days. Uh, Thanksgiving was a week later, whatever it was. And there was an article written that we lost in the ratings. Two shows, right? And that burned me. It pissed me off that we're writing a rating story. We literally had done two shows. No way to judge ratings on that. And I remember going into that Thanksgiving, uh, November 2020, and I was unsure. I knew I knew we were going to do a good show. That never that was never an issue to me. But I was like, man, they just wrote a story that, you know, our ratings weren't good after two shows. Are we? Is the audience going to come back? Are they willing to accept me back and accept us together as a partnership? Mm. And I will tell you, from January of 2021 through essentially July of 2023, you have not only accepted me back, you've accepted the concept of Carton and Roberts, and I am forever grateful to the men and women that make up our audience because you prove that second chances are possible, that redemption is possible, and if you are honest and transparent about the mistakes that you made and you lean on the audience to support you, the audience is there for you. Mm. And I am forever grateful to the listeners of WFAN who said it was okay for me to be back. And I, I don't pay lip service to that. That's real. No other medium has that level of personal connection. And it's the only question mark I had when I did come back. And I am grateful to all of you 
for allowing Evan and I to get to number one. We are number one to allow us to, uh, you know, my job when I got here, they said, look, here's the deal. You got to beat Michael K. Period. Stop. Uh, ESPN had started winning uh, the afternoon ratings battle. Not significantly. It was close, but they had won a bunch of ratings uh, battles. And my job was regain control of afternoons with Evan uh, and beat ESPN. And I'm very proud to say, because the audience bought into the notion of me being back and you and I working together, that we've not only beaten them, we have put them out of business, essentially. We have dominated uh, Michael K and Don LaGreca and that little no good weasel that works with them. And I'm very proud of that. And when I look back at my career, that's one of the great accomplishments, you know, egotistically, of my career that I had a job to do. And we did that job together, all of us, Big Mac, Tommy, a part of it as well, uh, in spades. Because uh, that's something that can never be taken away. You can rip me. You can take shots at me for my mistakes. You can say you hate the type of show I do. Uh, we've done over the last three years, but it's tangible. Like, you can never take away the tangible facts that we now own afternoons, and we've dominated the competition starting in January of 2021 through July of 2023. And I know that's cocky. I know that's arrogance. I know that's ego. Guilty, guilty, guilty on all three counts. But it's real, and it's tangible, and that is just proof positive that, you know, FAN did make a good decision putting you and I together and the reality that you're really good at what you do. And whether you work with Tiki or me or anyone else, there's no doubt that you will continue that level of success here at WFAN. Well, I appreciate it. I, I had nothing to do with your comeback and the second chance that you got a couple of years ago and you've taken full advantage of. But I have had, like, this view of the impact you've made on a lot of people. And I'm proud to have witnessed that because I think you realize you've made an impact on a lot of people, but it's probably more than you even realize. And getting to sit here and watch that, besides the selfishness of having a fun, successful show sure, with you, sure. which I admit that's been a lot of fun. I've been honored to watch that for two and a half years because that's the, the reality. When you came back, you were given a second chance. You took full advantage of it. And to watch not only personally you take advantage of it, but what has happened to people around you. I can't tell you how many people have said to me, and I admit I've had nothing to do with it. Craig impacted me uh, this one time a year and a half ago. Craig's story did this to me. Craig did that for me. And that is more important than any success we've had is that success. Yeah, no And doubt. I've witnessed it from over here, yeah. and it's amazing to Thank see. Thank you. Uh, in, a, in a show of good faith also, I want to just say something. You know, there's a big story out there that, you know, if the Mets ever got Shohei Otani, Keith Hernandez would not permit him to wear his number 17. That's out there. Big story right from the other night when Gary Cohn asked him about it, right? Keith didn't say no. He just said, don't ask He's me. like, don't ask. They just, re <laughs> they just retired. It's my number. Ain't nobody else wearing it, right? <laughs> right. So the architect came to me, and he offered me the opportunity to take this microphone home that they were going to, like, dip it in gold or something, ah. and I could either take it home or he would put it in, in like, we've, like, um, I don't know what you call it, like, a, there's, like, a mirror box up here, a window box, whatever you call it, and it's got a couple knickknacks that, you know, that represent the history of, you know, our radio station wins, uh, CBS, all the stations that Odyssey owns. I've seen a Marconi in there. Yeah, there's a Marconi ward. So the architect came to me and said, listen, if you want, but and he goes, it would be my pleasure, nobody will ever use that microphone ever again. We will dip it in gold. <laughs> we will put it on some kind of plaque or something. Yeah. It'll be the Craig Cart microphone, and we will put it on display for as long as this station is here. I said no to that. <laughs> Unlike Keith Hernandez, if Tiki Barber or anybody else that's the future of this radio station wants to use the microphone that I made famous at number one, you have my blessing is, to do it. That is very nice of you. Just like it was very nice of Joe Namath to offer his retired number, <laughs> yeah, but I want to make something. Anymore, I'll tell you that. I want to make something very clear. <laughs> Keith Hernandez yeah. did nothing wrong. I didn't say that he did nothing. No, for anybody who thinks he did something wrong, he did. They retired his bleeping number. Why should he offer it to anybody? Just because Joe Namath did something nice right. and Craig Carton is doing something nice, yeah. doesn't mean that Keith Hernandez should say, "Please take my number." <laughs> Crap. Well, look, I'm in the Joe Namath camp. If somebody wants to use this microphone, 
I mean, I think you should clean it. <laughs> I, I, I do a lot of eating here. I, I, but feel free to take it. I got to tell you, much like I'm taking your office, I may take that seat as well while I'm at it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that answers the question. It's the Evan and Tiki show. <laughs> if Evan's moving over to this chair, Evan's taking off naming rights of the new afternoon show. There may be truth to that. So you want to just announce it now? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen. The name of the new afternoon show. It is either Evan and Tiki, Tiki and Evan, Roberts and Barber, Barber and Roberts. Or the Sean Morass show featuring Tiki, or Barber, that, and Evan or that. So tell us, uh, Evan, what is the new name it's of the show? just Evan and Tiki. That's it. Evan and Tiki! Yeah. By the way, whatever name comes first doesn't mean anything. You know that. Well, Did it really matter to you that after doing Boomer and Carton, yeah. it was then Carton and Roberts? I, Did that I, matter? No, I like no. to go with what sounds good. I agree. And Boomer and Carton, well, I mean, it was in Boomer's contract. I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. Let's, by the way, Boomer's got a good agent. Boomer's agent said, uh, it's the Boomer Assassin show. And they were like, yeah. I'm surprised Tiki didn't have it in his contract. Uh, well, Legendary yeah. former giant well, but working at the fan. To remember, he's joining you. You. Now, I get You're that. the incumbent star. No, I get that. With but all could've... due respect, Tiki and Tierney do a great job in middays. You're the star here, buddy. He still could have had it in his contract. What radio did Boomer do before he joined Craig Carton in mornings at WFAN? You know, to my knowledge, well, he had done Monday Night Football, of course. Uh, he did Inside the Huddle with Mad Dog uh, That's for true. a while. Him and Dog did a but show But he had again, never yes. really done uh, Daily Talk Radio. Matter of fact... He had a tryout with Monica Crowley I heard that. before he and I ever did a show together. Yeah, I heard. And after that tryout, I'm surprised they stayed with him. <laughs> <laughs> you putting that on Boomer? Oh, yeah. He yeah. was given a lot of co-hosts over that summer, and he had to adapt. No, I mean, Monica Crowley, I think they did a week or two together. And then he introduced me to her years later at Fox. Uh, lovely woman. Mm -hmm. Really nice. Can you imagine uh, an alternate WFN universe in which it was Boomer and Monica well, Crowley well, as opposed to, see, to Boomer and Carton? remember, so when I just got in trouble, right, and ultimately got fired, right, the deal was that th they weren't sure, do we do a sports show? Right. Do we do a quasi-political show? I know for, like, one of the guys that was desperate for the job, like, literally begs Let CBS. me guess. Geraldo Rivera. No, Joe Scarborough. Oh, Joe Scarborough. Joe, Morning, Joe Scarborough begged them for the job. Interesting. And there were a lot of people in the political world that thought because of the show Imus had done for many years prior to being fired, that FN would keep that type of show going. Right, right. Which is why Monica Crowley, obviously, you know, got a tryout. Uh, I know for a fact that... I'll tell you a funny story as we kind of reveal some uh, stories that have never been told before. One of the people that CBS at the time wanted very badly to do the show was John Stewart. All right? So they went to John Stewart. That's interesting because I'd heard his name around the Howard replacement. Okay. So listen to this. So they went to John Stewart to see if there'd be any interest. John right. Stewart, of course, was really towards the beginning of his real. Uh, power over at Comedy Central with The Daily Show. It was becoming a go-to show, like big audience, whatever, whatever, right? So the, the legend, now John and I were represented by the same guy, which is why I know this story to be factual. Uh, and the story was, you know, you know, I just made a lot of money. So there was a lot of money to play with. This is your know, radio 20 years ago, obviously, almost 20 years ago. So they, whatever amount of money they offered John Stewart to do five days a week, four hours a day, the John's response was, I make double <laughs> to work one hour a night, five days a week, and I have 20 writers. Right. Why would I ever leave that? <laughs> and that's why John Stewart never tried out. Because as you know, as you full well know, while TV may pay more money and you're more visible there's something special about radio. It's that bond you talked about at the top of the show that exists in radio that yeah. doesn't exist on TV. So, yeah, you can make more money doing what he did, even what you're about to do, and I totally respect that. But you know full well that this medium is the best one. Oh, I've never done because there that. are those those relationships that you form are so different. You're talking to your friends as opposed to the way television is. So, so this is interesting uh, right now. Uh, when the news was made public, I did not get a phone call from Al Dukes, and I was quite disappointed about that. I got kind of a, you know, kind of like a cop out text message, and it wasn't even like a congrats. It was more like, uh, you know, I don't even know what he wrote to me. It was kind of uh, obnoxious. Uh, and now I'm being told that Al's on his deathbed with COVID that he contracted in Indiana. 
and he's calling in, so I'll be gracious. I'll take the call. Al Dukes, uh, how you doing, buddy? Oh, hi there. Uh, I did text you that day, and yep. I wrote, uh, that was really good, or something like that, your, um, yep. your goodbye, or something like that. So I definitely, this day and age, we text. We don't make phone calls. No, really. no, no, no. You know, teenagers thing. text. Adults <laughs> phone each other. Yeah, I don't know. I never have anything to say. Like it's like I'm good at saying stuff in a text because I can look at it. I could, uh, you know, decide before it comes out of my mouth whether I want to hit send. You know that sort of thing. So yeah. I felt like I like I felt like Jerry because Jerry and I did discuss this. Like I feel like we did both send you a sort of a congratulations. Well, hold on, I'll tell you right now because I have my phone on okay. me. So uh, on June sixteenth at six in the morning, Jerry sent me a text message. Uh, congrats, CC. And that was that. Nothing else. Um, okay. Mine was probably more hard. <laughs> hold, on, hold on a sec. Pump up his vibe because I know he's under the weather, guys, if you don't mind. Al Duke sent me a text. Hold on, I'll get it right here. And that I sent was, that during the show. He, he writes, that was really well done. And then your reaction to C-Mac and Sal coming on was hilarious. Yeah. Um, here's our reality. Al's a dear, dear friend of mine. Uh, but the reality is this, and I've come to terms with it. If I don't call him, I will <laughs> never speak to him again for the rest of my life. <laughs> because I call him all the time, and obviously we talk. We're both in the car at 3 o'clock in the morning, the same kind of ride in. Right. If I don't call him, I'll never hear from him again. Sadly, I read his obituary to know that we he We all died. have friends like that. If you don't reach <laughs> out, it's over. Anyhow, you sound like you're not doing so good. What's going on? I know I must have caught this COVID. I blame the uh, like a hotel pillow because I know they clean those the covers, but that actual pillow material with the feathers or whatever they're using, that's just soaked in with people's germs. Yeah, and I know that's where I got it from. People say the airplane. I don't think so. You got your nose in that pillow for a couple nights. Forget it. Yeah, and you went to Indiana to see John Cougar Mellencamp. Is that right? I did, yeah. He was terrific. He was. So was it worth getting COVID to see uh, John Mellencamp? No, it was not worth getting COVID, but it was worth, like, I don't like to leave my house. It was worth leaving my house to get to go there and see it. And that's the weirdest thing to me. Al, and like I said, people are like, how come Al wasn't nominated for Pulse of the People? And I said, he hates people. Uh, you just, and you never leave your condo, and yet you left your condo, drove to Newark Airport, I'm assuming, got on yes. a plane, went to Indiana, stayed in a hotel for two nights, saw John Mellencamp, got back on a plane, flew back, had a deal with people, and got sick. Yeah, uh, but I've decided for the people, the older people that I really like, the music people, you have to see them before they die. God, so who else is on that list? Well, I've seen Bruce Springsteen a couple times. I'm seeing only only singers that are in their 70s right now. That's who I'm going Got to see it. this summer. Al's also the guy, uh, I remember famously when he went to a couple of Bruce shows and uh, came back, and, and Bruce is his favorite artist, right? Yeah. And he go, I go, how was the Springsteen concert? I think it was the one in Brooklyn. I could be wrong on that. And he goes, yeah, he, he played too much. <laughs> played yeah. too much. And I go, don't you love Springsteen? He goes, yeah, he's my favorite. And Al goes... But three hours, <laughs> uh, you know, just a little too much. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's the thing. Like, yeah. So the Springsteen shows have been 29 to 30 songs. Mellencamp was 18 songs. Good night, everybody. No encore. <laughs> Take it easy. Get lost. And you don't feel ripped off after that? You felt yeah. like that was pleasing? That was enough? It was pleasing. Yeah. Now, I do want to tell no one problem. story since we're going to reminisce, I'm sure, a lot today. One of my one of my favorite moments of Boomer and Carton involving Al Dukes was we were going to do our show uh, up at a Mohegan Sun in Connecticut. And uh, one of the guys at Mohegan Sun said, hey, good news, guys. Van Halen's in town. And this is when David Lee Roth had once again you know, started touring with them as the lead singer instead of uh, Sammy, right? So we had known the story about when I was kind of like the producer of the David Lee Roth show. And David Lee Roth sent his henchman, Animal, to go kill Al Dukes because he had bad ratings and I was... You know, just the messenger, and it's like, kill the messenger, right? So Boom and I decide we want to get David Lee's attention and make sure he sees Al Dukes at the concert. (laughs) So now Al is also, as he'll tell you, a big fan of Van Halen, right? Love him. So so we try to set up where we're, we wanted to sit front row. My recollection is that we were kind of side stage. I don't remember exactly where we were. 
Yeah, and the no, whole I... night, Boomer's yelling, David, it's Al! <laughs> it's Al! And as much as Al loves Van Halen, he had the worst time ever <laughs> at that concert, oh. right? All I was they, all I was hoping is that you sometimes hear performers say they can't see the audience in front of them because of the lights. Yeah. That's all I was hoping for that night was that the lights were in David Lee Roth's eyes and he would not see me, or I might have gotten a karate kick. Yeah, the whole night, David Lee, it's Al Dukes. <laughs> you remember Al Dukes? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, listen, you know I love you. Uh, hopefully, you feel better, and uh, you have my phone number. And I think I, it, I think it's only fair at this stage of the game that I not call you again until you call me first. That's fair. And then once you break that, then we're good. By the way, the one thing I do have to say about Alan, I always appreciated this. Early on, when the idea was floated about me doing the show with you, one of the early people I reached out to was Al Dukes. Okay. To get his opinion. And I think the first thing Al told me was, yeah, I think it's a terrible idea. And I always no. appreciated your honor. <laughs> now, he did come around and say, yeah, I thought about it. It could work. But I always appreciated the brutal honesty Good. of Al Dukes. Al? <laughs> well, I don't recall that. I do recall early on what I thought was an interesting dynamic between the two of you is Craig would always – your arguments were, were oftentimes not fact-based. And Evan <laughs> has the facts, statistics on the top of his head about – Games that happened eight years ago, it's so bizarre right. how he would know that. And as he's spitting out actual statistical facts, that you, you just keep plowing over him with your argument, even <laughs> though it has no real basis. I got used it to that. so great. I was like, this is perfect. <laughs> hey, well, imagine if it was Bart Scott. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. Well, look, I appreciate you calling in. I know you don't feel well, so I'm sure you want to get back into bed and uh, watch some kind of Netflix show on a missing no, family listen, in I Indiana. This, I got this show on until 6 o'clock. You better not leave early. This is our, no, this I'll be until 6. Class. Although I was told I just left uh, midway through his show and dropped the mic and never came back. So I'm, I'm contemplating that. That's got to be on the table, right? I'm <laughs> contemplating that, that maneuver as well. And by well, the way, I've got a recommendation for you since I know you like to recommend all these like whodunit, you know, uh, Dayline yeah. ID type shows. Have you seen the uh, the documentary on the curious case of Natalia Grace or no? I have seen that, yes. So long story short, this family adopts what they think is like a Ukrainian baby or something like that. And it turns out that the little girl they adopted was actually a 40-year-old dwarf. <laughs> <laughs> No, I don't think that was exactly it, but it's a similar circumstance. <laughs> I like that. And though. then, like, and then but that. I think like the the woman who you know the mom who adopts us, what she thinks is a baby, I think got arrested for like neglect or something. Uh, or I don't know the entire story. And she was like, "She's not a child. <laughs> She's a forty year old well, dwarf." Hold on, I got a lot of vacation time coming up. I got to write this down. What's it called? I think it's the right out of the curious case yeah. of Natalia Grace. I think Natalia Grace. Yeah, and it's on uh, Discovery Plus app. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> that sounds like an activity. Yeah, that that I, I I was really into that the first couple episodes, and it just became that father just crying on camera nonstop. I was like, "What is this guy? That whole family seems crazy." Yeah. The woman, the girl was. They thought they were adopting a six-year-old, and then turned out she was like twenty-six or something. <laughs> close, close enough. Close. <laughs> yeah, it was close. <laughs> All right, buddy. I love you. I'll talk to you soon and get better. Okay. Sure. There you go, Al Dukes. You guys can hit that button over there. So, did you find it or no? Did I find what? I thought you were writing down the name of the. Oh, documentary. I wrote it down. I have it for later. I'm yeah, not gonna yeah, yeah. watch it now. <laughs> yeah, 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 I got go. a lot of things I need to watch. The Mets suck. Everything's depressing. I got a lot of vacation time. No Craig. I'm gonna start watching a bunch of crap. I'm just seeing now that Fan put out some type of little video of uh, some of the highlights of our show. Oh, really? Uh, I have to. I have to take a look at that. Oh. It, I, this is funny. When I try to pop that thing on your elbow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll never forget that. <laughs> oh, look at that. I think I stabbed it with the screwdriver. Well, well, hold on a second. It just hit me. Isn't today the day we find out about the Pulse of the People? Oh, that's right. At 5 o'clock, I think. I mean, it just hit me. Like, what today's time the we day. Find out? What time? 5 o'clock. 
Five o'clock today, the announcement will be wow. made on who wins the pulse of the people. Oh, I can't wait for this. Yeah. How about that? How depressed will you be if you don't win this? Well, it's either me, Stu Finer, or uh, Joe, Douglas. Joe Douglas. Yeah. You might want to have Joe Douglas call in. Uh, get his take when he loses the pulse of the people. I mean, if you don't win on the day of your final show at FAN, yeah, that would suck. on June 30th, yeah. 2023, <laughs> I don't know, man. I think it's going to ruin everything. By the way, for me, too. Yeah. Yeah. How do I live with myself? I don't know. If I don't go home with my seventh pulse of the people thumb. Killer. <laughs> I assume we got to take a break at some point, right? Yeah. Good assumption. Yeah. Or not. Or <laughs> not. Do we have to? It's your last day. Do what you want. That's... Joe's in Elizabeth. There you go, <laughs> Joe, Joe, what's up, kiddo? Hey, Craig and Evan. Yeah. Hey, Art. So first time calling. Probably the last time calling, Craig. So I just wanted to say Congratulations. Thank you for being one of the realest, realest celebrities ever. That goes for Evan, too. Yep. Nothing but the best. Thanks for being pro green. And uh, good luck. And Met, Evan, Met suck. Yes, they nice, do. Nice, nice. I think that encapsulates exactly where we are as a show. Yeah. Craig is uh, leaving us in the midst of the worst <laughs> season in Met history. And Thank by you. the way, it's hard to give tickets away. Like, my cousin has great seats uh, at City Field. Yeah. Uh, like, I don't know, field level seats, wherever they are. I showed you to him, right? Right. And he's like, look, I can't go family commitment. I got four tickets for Friday and four tickets for Sunday. I don't even know who they're playing. And I'm like, yeah, no problem. I'm sure there's a guy at the station or at Fox that, you know, Met fan wants to go. Great, you know, great seats, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, Do not ask 17 people. <laughs> no, I understand. Before I got somebody to say yes to that. That's uh, tough. Oh, it's going to be ugly. If you're a Met season ticket holder, brace for it. It is going to get ugly. Right? You won't be able to get sell tickets. You can't hand them out like you said. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. Anyway, 877-337-6666. I uh, appreciate you being patient, hanging on for a second. Uh, let's take care of a little business here, and we'll continue on. Uh, we're, I, listen, I'm not leaving early. Well, uh, well, I mean, uh, by the way, <laughs> just coming down here from Fox, the traffic at the Holland Tunnel, I got here at a quarter to one about, 20 to one. It's already got to be an hour and a half to get out of the city. Really? At least at the Holland Tunnel. I got to imagine uh, all the crossings are jacked. Obviously, you know, it's, it's an extended weekend. Yeah. It's July 4th, Tuesday. yeah, yeah. yeah. It is nuts right now trying to get out of the city. Nuts. So, you know, we appreciate you having us on. We'll get you there as best we can.